What's poppin' YouTube family? It's your girl, Show the LT, your fave occupational therapist here to help you and others live their best lives. Let's get started. Bye. Hello, loves. Hello, darlings. Happy New Year. Happy 2023. Y'all ain't seen me since like April of last year. So y'all probably like, girl, how you just gonna pop back on here with a video? You know what? We are not, we're not gonna talk about that big gap that I, I took, okay? The thing is, is I'm back, okay? That's the only thing that matters, all right? So I don't wanna hear any negativity, all right? I'm back and that's all that matters. <laughs> No, but for real, I had to take a long break. Um, I had a lot going on. Um, work, planning a wedding, moving and living in a new city. That was a lot. And YouTube had to take a back burner. Um, but I always knew in my heart that I was going to come back. And so I said, you know what? Don't even put that pressure on yourself to do all the things all the time. Um, just come back when you're ready. And this year I feel ready. Um, I made it a point and set a goal for myself to be more consistent with YouTube because I do want to make it a priority in my life. I care about it. Um, I like putting my time and energy into it. So I really do want to um, start, you know, being more consistent, making more videos. You know, I really do. I love it. Um, and it, I felt like I was like getting signs and things that I needed to get back into it, like um, talking to different colleagues and like um, talking to different students and things like that, and them saying that they saw my videos and that my video helped them like get into their OT program and stuff like that. Like, this was like what six seven months after i had stopped making videos and people were still watching them and um like still benefiting from them so i'm like you know what if like these videos are helping people you got to keep doing it you just you got to keep doing it so that's why i'm back here oh and also who told y'all to get me to 900 subscribers <laughs> i haven't even looked and i came back and looked and i was at 900 and i said hold on wait a minute who like who told y'all to just come and show me love like this so i really appreciate that i can't believe i'm this close to a thousand subscribers and i literally haven't posted in like seven months so i appreciate y'all so much like literally it means the world to me that y'all um y'all benefit from what i'm what i'm saying to y'all so all right enough of that we got that out the way i'm back <laughs> Let's get into the video. Okay, so today's video is going to be about what you learn in school versus what you use in practice. Okay, I was sitting down brainstorming, trying to figure out like what video topics do I really want to come and like, you know, talk about with y'all. Um, and I was sitting down with my friend Beck and she literally came up with this great idea of like, you know, we learn all these things in school and we think we're going to use them. And then we get out into practice and it's like not even like what you envision. So I want to just put a disclaimer at the beginning of this video that I'm not saying that the things you learn in school aren't useful and that you're not going to use them. I just think you're not going to use them in the way that you think you might use them. Um, so I just want to put a disclaimer. I'm not saying don't learn what your professors are telling you to learn. That is not what I'm saying. Do what you got to do to pass them tests. Do what you got to do to pass boards, okay? I'm just saying that you are not going to be using some of the things in school like you think you're going to be using them out in practice. So that's what this video is about. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Okay, the first thing that I feel personally that I do not use every day out in practice are these theories and frames of references that we learn in school, okay? I ain't used the EHP, the MOHO, the all the things. I probably can't even remember the rest of them. I haven't used any of that in practice, okay? Now, I'm saying, like, the foundations of them are probably embedded in my everyday practice, okay? Right? Right? But I'm not sitting down with a kid and thinking, okay, I'm gonna use the this frame of reference today with you, or oh, this theory is gonna be implemented in this session today. I'm not doing none of that. I'm just being honest. I'm just telling y'all the real. That is not occurring in my everyday life as an occupational therapist, okay? And once again, 
these are personally me this is me this is my life this is what i do um and you can think differently or you can feel differently you can feel that you do use theories and frame of reference every day when you go to work and kudos to you but me personally i'm not using those so <laughs> take that with a grain of salt okay so you learn them you i feel like you need to learn them to get that foundation but like once you're out in practice don't think that you're gonna be using these these theories and frame of references every single day and um they're gonna truly impact the way you conduct your your therapy basically because i don't in, in my opinion i do not <laughs> next i know i spent many hours many of hours slaving over my laptop my notebook all the things writing out these long detailed soap notes okay i mean I got so much feedback and red marks and all the things all on my soap notes because they weren't right and all the things. And baby, when I tell you, when I tell you, it's not that deep. <laughs> it is not that deep out here in these streets, all right? <laughs> they, okay, once again, I'm gonna reiterate this all throughout because I don't want anybody to misconstrue my message, okay? You need to know how to write a soap note, how they teach you in school, okay? Because that's how you're, that's how you're gonna learn how to write a soap note in general, okay? But I just want you to know that while you are stressing over how this soap note looks right now in school, it's not that deep when you get out and practice. You just need to make sure you're documenting everything that happens in your session. Um, and you just put a quick blurb in each section and you go about your business. You're not writing paragraphs on paragraphs on paragraphs when you get out. Like, don't do that. <laughs> don't stress, okay? So that's all I'm telling you right now. So it might seem like, oh, dang, like, how am I going to document when I'm actually out in practice? Like, this is too much. Don't worry. It's not that deep. <laughs> it is not that deep. You're not about to be writing paragraphs on paragraphs in your soap notes, okay? You're going to document what you need to document. You're going to use a lot of abbreviation, um, and you'll get, get the hang of that super fast and then you'll go about your business. Okay. It's okay. You'll be, oh, you'll be okay. Not that deep. All right. <laughs> Next, this might be a show thing. Okay. I, I don't know if I can generalize this to everybody, but for me personally, and as an occupational therapist that works with kids in a pediatric clinic, um, you know, those session plans that you probably are writing in school. I'm not writing those. I do not write session plans for my kids. I might think of a plan, think of an idea five, 10 minutes before I see the kid, but I'm not writing down a session plan for my kid. You know why? Because I've worked with them before, most likely. I know their goals. I know what we're trying to target. I don't really need to write down a session plan um, to know what we're gonna do. Now, granted, if you just if you're in school or just getting out of school, you might need to do that. But I promise you, like honestly, what I'm a year and a half out now, I would say probably three months at, after I graduated and actually was practicing, you get the hang of it. Like you just know what you're gonna do. You don't have to write down a session plan. Um, and I know I was writing down detailed session plans when I was in school, but that's not really the case when you're out in practice. Like, you know, you know your clients, you know what you're gonna work on. Um, and honestly, you get so you get so good at it that you don't even need like I I gotten in the habit of letting my kids pick what they want to play with and then I alter how we play with it in order to address their goals. Like I don't I literally I, I make it up as I go. I don't know if I'm supposed to be admitting this, but I do. <laughs> uh, I, I make it up as I go because I find that if the kid is able to pick out what we play with, they feel like they've made their own choice. They have that autonomy um, and they're motivated because it's something they want to play with. And then I can just adjust how we play with it in order to reach our goals. So yeah, session plans, not really a thing. Listen, in my world, it's not at least. <laughs> All right, next. Okay, so the next thing is diagnoses are not definitive okay so i feel like in school we learned all these diagnoses we learned all hey onyx how you doing dude <laughs> you're just gonna make an appearance in my video like this okay all right he'll be back there 
there's onyx all right but like i was saying um a diagnosis is not definitive all right we in school we learned all these diagnoses and then we learned all these symptoms that go along with these diagnoses and i feel like in my brain in school i was like all right whenever we see this diagnosis we had to expect these symptoms and that's not really the case like every client is different this one kid with autism is not going to present the same as another kid with autism one kid with down syndrome is not going to pre present the same as the, another kid with down syndrome like that's not the case they might have like general similarities but there are going to be differences and you have to make sure that you're treating the person not the diagnosis like you're not going to do the same thing with every di like down syndrome kid you're not going to do the same thing with every kid that has autism like you're not that's not that's not how it works like you have to treat the person not the diagnosis okay last but definitely not least um i don't know um about you guys but I am I'm an OTR student well I was an OTR student um and so I feel like in school we learned about code of supervision um and I feel like I got I feel like I got um I feel like I didn't get a realistic view of what code of supervision actually entailed um and I also wish that um they would in schools would probably tell you um, that just because you have that title of OTR does not mean that you know more than a CODA. Um, so basically, so I supervise CODAs and I give that that required direct supervision that I need or whatever. Um, I sign off on their notes. Um, and then I go about my business I'm, because baby, the codas I supervise, I am not looking over their shoulders. I'm not checking to see if they know what they're doing. Like they are well, well knowledgeable individuals and know what the heck they do and don't need me to tell them what to do. Okay. The difference between me and the coda is that I do evaluations. I, you know, present the plan of care and they see it through. Like I'm not dictating what they do and I feel like if that's what my brain was doing like that's what I was thinking while I was in school that I would be overseeing the coda or dictating what they were supposed to do and all those things and that that's not the case whatsoever like my colleagues my codas that I work with like they are as knowledgeable if not more knowledgeable than I am and I learn so much from them every day so that's just something that I feel like OTR students should keep in mind while they're in schools that yeah we supervise them um because we have those credentials behind our name um but in no way shape or form um are we more knowledgeable than they are and I think that's something that you know could be useful for OTR students to learn as they get out into practice but those are the five things I feel like we learn in school that, you know, it's not quite reality once we get out in practice. And so thank y'all so much for listening to what I had to say. It felt so good to finally get back out in front of the camera. I mean, I can't tell you how much mental turmoil I had at the thought of sitting down and recording this video after so long of not doing it. Um, so it felt really good to just sit down and do it and like, you know, dust my shoulders off, you know, get back in the swing of things. So thank y'all so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.